Hi, I'm Bob Gimlin. And fair use, which we see so often, is a U.S. legal doctrine that permits limited use of copyrighted material without permission from all relevant holders. Fair use began as a response to printing presses, who would simply reprint other publications and therefore not have to pay for writers of their own. But in modern times, in regards to the internet, fair use is generally in good faith. This video is a little different than my past videos. I'm going to read a Bigfoot report, which I find credible, plausible, and quite frankly terrifying. The man who would eventually write the report, under the name S.D. Baker, was only a child while the events occurred. So the report is the result of what he could gather from his elders. But now an adult, he drafted and submitted the report under the pen name S.D. Baker. And no one should dare attack his credibility for using a pen name. That kind of stuff can really mess with people's lives. To me personally, this report has such significance and such value because the reporter is a writer. Writing is his claimed profession. This is rare. Us writer types train our brains in evaluating characters, plot cohesion, and overall consistency and vibration. S.D. Baker does not want to write because he is interested in Bigfoot. He just happens to be a writer with Bigfoot experience, which is a rare, interesting, and useful dynamic. The incident occurred in Washington State in the 1960s. The report is entitled, for reasons soon apparent, The Cowman of Copolis Beach. To be clear, the following are not my words. They are the carefully chosen words constructed by a second and first hand witness, a writer who goes by the name Baker. So finally, I will now read the Baker report in its entirety. And tis the season, after all. So there's nothing wrong with letting the imagination wander, and perhaps dimming the lights. Because this just may be the most unsettling of all the contemporary and credible Bigfoot encounters. Or in this case, I guess, Bigfoot altercations? Anyway, long story short, this is my retelling of Baker's Cowman Report. And I hope you find it as interesting and intriguing as I do. The Cowman of Copalas Beach by S.D. Baker My dad worked in the timber industry his whole life. His father was a logger, and he grew up in and around the woods. My dad started his own logging company when he was 18, and has owned and operated shake and shingle mills from Oregon clear up to Thorn Bay, Alaska. He is an intelligent man and holds over a dozen patents for various pieces of equipment he has designed and built over the years. He has employed dozens of people over the years, all of them spending extensive time in the wilderness. When I was a boy, I remember hearing bits and pieces of conversations among some of the men at the mill. Although nobody would tell me directly, I understood that something had gone on before I was born, and it involved one of the foremen, named John. They weren't joking around. They were genuinely afraid, and wouldn't talk about it with a kid. When I was young, my dad wouldn't tell me about it, because I would often go into the woods, cutting blocks with him on the weekends, and he didn't want me to be afraid of the woods. While I was speaking with him last weekend, I told him a couple of strange events that happened to me later in the wilderness, and that reminded me of the hints at a story I heard when I was a boy. After some prodding, he told me the following story. In the mid-1960s, my dad owned a large roofing product mill in Aberdeen, Washington. He had teams of men that would cut fallen old-growth cedar salvage left after logging operations. He had permits to salvage a large amount of wood in the coastal areas of Grays Harbor County, primarily in the area of Coppolis Beach. Several of the men on his cutting crews lived in and around Coopolis Beach. His foreman, a man I will call John for the story, was a bright, down-to-earth hard worker. My dad trusted him with thousands of dollars of vehicles and equipment, as well as the safety of his crews. He was not the kind of man to make up stories, 
On a Monday morning, sometime in July, John was several hours late for work. This was highly unusual, as he was always there early, getting the saws and trucks ready for the day. My dad said John was visibly shaken up, and when he asked him what was wrong, he asked my dad to go into the office so the others wouldn't hear them speak. They went in and sat down, and John simply said, Something destroyed our house this weekend. My dad thought he said, Someone broke into the house, and asked John if it was someone he knew. John said, You don't understand. This wasn't a person. It was a... I don't know what it was, but it completely trashed the house. The family is going to stay with my brother in Elma for a while. My dad asked him to explain what had happened. John said that when he got home from work Friday evening, his youngest son, Tim, who was around four at the time, told him he saw a big, quote, cow man walking at the edge of their field that afternoon. He thought the boy meant cowboy because some of their neighbors wore cowboy hats when they were out in the sun. He asked him if the man was wearing a cowboy hat. The boy said, no, daddy, he was a cow man, furry and stinky like the cows. He asked his wife if she knew what he was talking about, and she said Tim was playing on the porch that afternoon when he came running in and said the cow man was stuck on the fence. He was very excited, so she went out to see what he was talking about. She said as she opened the door, she was hit by a horrible smell, like wet dogs and garbage. Tim was pointing across to the field opposite their house and said, He got loose. She looked where he was gesturing and could see the top strand of barbed wire bouncing up and down, as if somebody, or something, had just pulled on it really hard and let it go. She didn't see the cow man, and noticed nothing out of the ordinary, except for the stench. She told Tim to come inside to play for the rest of the day. She felt uneasy and a little scared. Their older son, John Jr., who was 12 at the time, was at a friend's house and walked home a short while after Tim saw his, quote, cowman. He told her somebody had followed him home, walking in the woods off the right side of the road. He never saw who it was. They never left the woods, but he said it had to be a really big man. He would hear large sticks cracking and the footsteps sounded very heavy. Once he got to the driveway of their house, where the woods stopped at the field, where his brother had his sighting, the footsteps stopped as well, and John Jr. never saw anything. He was pretty shaken up by the event, and wanted his dad to go to the woods and check it out with him. Later that evening, John strapped on his 357 and took his older son out into the field to have a look. They first walked to the area where the cow man was supposedly stuck on the fence, and walked down the fence line looking for anything. They came upon a large clump of long reddish-brown hair tangled in the top of the strand of barbed wire. He tried to pull it off, but it was really tangled up, so he pulled out his buck knife and sawed it off. He said the hair was over a foot long, real coarse and stringy. There appeared to be a bit of flesh matted in the top of the clump, and the top of the wire was pulled loose from one of the posts. Whatever was hung up there on the fence was very big. He handed the hair to his son to hold, and they climbed through the fence and walked toward the woods. He said he was looking for any signs of tracks on the ground. The hair kind of looked like it was from a horse's mane or tail. The ground was solid and grassy. It was a field, and there were no hoof prints or any other tracks he could see. The edge of the woods began about ten feet from the fence line, and they entered on a small game trail that deer frequented. It was around eight at night, and in the woods it was getting to be fairly dark. They walked for a ways and soon began to smell the rotting garbage wet dog odor his wife had reported earlier. John said he got the feeling that they were being watched. The hair on the back of his neck was standing up. He told his son they should head back before it got too dark, and the boy didn't argue. As they began walking back out, they could hear heavy footsteps off to their left. They stopped, and the footsteps stopped. They walked on nearly to the clearing, and John whispered to his son, Run like hell to the house, on the count of three. John Jr. nodded, and John whispered, One, two, three, and gave his son a push in the back to get him started, then spun around and raced off the trail to the opposite direction, toward the footsteps with his gun drawn. Off the trail, the underbrush was dense, with ferns and bushes. He had a hard time making headway, but as he got closer, he could hear it moving away from him, deeper into the woods, 
At this time, he told my dad that he thought it was a vagrant camping out in the woods and possibly scoping houses out to rob at night. John was a big man and capable of taking care of himself in most any situation, and he had a large caliber handgun, so he wasn't too worried about confronting a vagrant in the woods. He was a few yards off the trail in deep brush when he heard the movement. Stop, just ahead of him. He stopped to look and listen. He thought he saw movement by a large tree, like someone was trying to hide there. He leveled his gun and said, Come out nice and slow, or I swear to God, I'll come back there and shoot you. It was silent for a moment, and then he caught movement out of the corner of his eye and spun around to his right for a better look. He said it looked like a huge bear moving through the brush. He could only see bits of it through the dense ferns, but it was moving quietly, away from the trees on four legs. It was about 15 feet away from him. At first he thought it was a bear, and then suddenly he saw a huge hairy arm with a human-like hand reach out of the brush and grab a small alder tree. The tree was about four inches in diameter, and it grabbed hold about five feet up. He said it happened so fast it was a blur, but the thing pulled itself upright out of the brush by holding the tree. It stood on two legs, turned its upper body to glare at John. It was enormous. He couldn't believe how bulky it was. He said it was well over seven feet tall, and at least half that big through the chest. It was too dark to make out many features, but its eyes seemed to glow a deep red, and he thought he could see teeth, like it was curling its lips back. It stood for just a brief moment, and then lunged ahead, pushing on the tree with tremendous force. The tree snapped loudly and crashed into the trees around it, getting hung up in the branches and not falling to the ground. It then disappeared into the deep brush with frightening speed, and sounding like a bulldozer with no engine sounds. John stood there in shock, his gun temporarily forgotten. Then he realized it was heading toward the house, the way his son had went. He turned and ran to the trail, hoping to gain ground on it and cut it off before it reached the clearing. He hit the trail and ran as fast as he could toward the clearing, all the while hearing the creature crash and thrash through the brush on his side. He burst into the clearing and looked frantically about for his son. John Jr. was standing just inside of the fenced-in field, waiting for his dad. John screamed at him to run to the house. Then he saw the thing crash out of the woods, about fifty feet to his left. It crossed the ten-foot clearing and stepped over the fence in two strides, and was running through the field parallel to his son in a matter of seconds. John screamed at his son to run faster, and took aim at the creature. He didn't fire because he was afraid to hit his son or his house, so he vaulted over the fence and ran in pursuit of them. He could see it, angling towards his son, and knew there was no way his boy would make it to the gate before it cut him off. In desperation, he pointed the gun to the ground at his side and fired as he ran, hoping to scare it. It veered more sharply toward his son and put an enormous burst of speed. He heard his boy scream. As they seemed to collide, he saw the creature dip its shoulder down a little bit, and suddenly John Jr. was airborne. He flew about ten feet, then hit the ground rolling. The creature never paused. It continued to run at an amazing speed, in a loop back toward the woods. Once the line of fire was clear, John stopped, and squeezed off the remaining five rounds at the retreating creature. He was pretty sure all the shots went wild. The creature never made a sound or slowed down, and was soon over the fence and back into the woods. He reached his son, who was shaken up, but not physically hurt. He asked his dad if it was a bear. Apparently, little John was so busy running for the house that he didn't see the creature running after him. He said something big and black suddenly ran into him, and he felt a huge paw hit his bottom, and he said he felt like he was falling. John pulled his son to his feet, and they ran through the gate and into the house, locking the door behind him. They were both out of breath and white as ghosts. His wife was screaming at him, demanding to know what the gunshots were for, and if they were all right. When he could catch his breath... He told her to make sure the back door was locked. He was going to call the sheriff. He went to the phone and began to dial the number. This was before 911. Then stopped and wondered what exactly he was going to say. He hung up the phone, realizing what an idiot he would look like if he told the sheriff that the boogeyman just chased him and his kid out of the woods. He told his wife that it was a large animal, possibly a bear. He didn't know how to begin to tell her that their four-year-old was right 
his cowman, was real, and it was more frightening than anything he could imagine. He told them to keep all the doors locked and stay away from the windows. Around 10 o'clock that night, both boys were in bed, and John and his wife sat down to watch the news. They soon heard a loud, moaning cry, kind of like the siren on the volunteer fire department. It would stretch out for a long time, and then end with a whoop-whoop sound. It was coming from the woods, opposite the house. His wife asked, What the hell is that? And John answered truthfully, That is Tim's cowman. He then described to her the full detail of what had happened, and she immediately wanted to call the sheriff. He persuaded her that they would sound crazy, and that he would handle it himself. She reluctantly agreed, and told him she didn't want either of the kids to go outside until this thing was gone. The howling went on until around midnight. When it got quiet again, John wanted to stay up through the night and watch over the house, but he had a long day at work, and the excitement earlier had worn him out. They went to bed around one in the morning, and had no further problems that night. They slept in that morning. The boys were already up and watching cartoons when they got out of bed. The first thing little John said was that he had heard the bear rubbing against the house last night. He said he was too scared to get up and tell his parents, and fell back asleep soon after. Then Tim said, The cow man talks funny. This stopped John cold. He asked his son, When did you talk to the cow man? Tim replied, Last night, in my room. John asked, The cow man was in your room? No, Daddy, he's too big for my room. He talked to my window. Tim said, and turned back to the cartoons. What did the cow man say, Tim? John asked. He talks funny. I don't know what he said. He talks like, Ooh-ah, 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 Tim said, and started making strange monkey-like noises. Did the cowman try to get in your window? John asked, breaking out in a cold sweat. No, he's too big for that. He made funny faces. He has Lincoln Log teeth, Tim said with a smile. John later learned Tim meant it had square teeth that looked like the same size as the small blocks in a Lincoln Log set. It apparently spent quite a while talking and making faces outside the boy's window. Tim said it lay down and went to sleep outside, and you could hear it snoring. John walked to his younger son's room and cautiously peered out the window. No sleeping cowman. John told the boys to get dressed, and they were going to visit their uncle in Elma for the day. After his wife and kids left, he called one of the men from his crew and asked him to come over. I'll call him Patrick. He was an ex-state patrolman, and my dad said he was kicked off the force because of his drinking problem. He was a good worker and never got drunk before dark so John figured they would have the most of the day to look for this thing. When Patrick arrived, John greeted him at the door and said, Are you up for some hunting? Seeing how it was not hunting season, Patrick told him he doesn't poach and doesn't even want to know about it if John did. John told him it wasn't a deer he was after, and went on to explain the previous night's events. Patrick didn't really believe him, but could see he was sincere and still shooken up. John had his pistol, and a bolt-action 30 6 Patrick had a 38 in his car, and John loaned him a 12-gauge. They first circled the house, looking for any signs of a nocturnal visitor. At the back of the house, there was a spigot for the garden hose, and it always leaked. There was a patch of ground, worn bare of grass under it, and it had turned into mud. In the center of the mud, there was a huge, clear imprint of what looked like a bare, human foot. John said it was at least 18 inches long, and very wide. It was so clear that he got the feeling it was left there on purpose. They found no other prints around the house, and in places in the field and woods where a track could be made, the creature seemed to avoid. Off to the side of the track, in the mud, there were four straight lines, around 8 inches long. He said it looked like someone had raked their fingers through the mud. When they circled around the side of the house, they got to Tim's window. They saw what it was for. Above the top of the window, a good seven feet up, were four muddy streaks. And on the window itself were dozens of large muddy fingerprints. The glass wasn't cracked or broken, just smeared with mud. By this time, Patrick was fast becoming convinced something strange had indeed happened the night prior. Before going out into the woods, John wanted to feed the family's pigs. They had two of them, apparently, 
fairly young, weighing around 40 pounds each. The pig pen was about 100 yards away from the house, behind an old barn. As they got closer, John became convinced and concerned, because they couldn't hear them making any noise. Usually they squealed like crazy when they knew food was near at hand, but this morning it was completely silent. They rounded the corner, and the pen was empty. No sign of damage or struggle. The pigs were just gone. They searched the barn, but found nothing out of place. So they decided to hit the woods and try to kill this thing. They entered on the same trail John and John Jr. had used the day before. John showed Patrick the broken fence wire and told him again about the hare. It was a bright summer morning, and John was surprised at the difference from the previous evening. The night before had been still and silent. Now the woods were alive with birds and small animals. He showed Patrick the broken tree, and they followed the creature's trail and found several more trees and large branches, twisted and broken. They could see large, faint impressions of footprints, where the ground was soft. They followed the deer trail further into the woods and encountered nothing unusual. By noon, they were both getting hungry, so they hiked back to the house for lunch. They spent the rest of the day poking around, but saw nothing more out of the ordinary. Just before dark that night, his wife and kids drove up. He and Patrick were sitting on the porch with guns, watching the woods. His wife asked if they had seen anything. John told her about the footprint and mud on the window. Patrick had retrieved a pint of booze from his car and was well on his way to getting smashed. John decided he didn't want a frightened drunk with a gun around his family, so he suggested that Patrick go home. Nothing was going to happen anyway. Patrick agreed and drove off, and John continued to watch the woods. His wife brought out a plate of food and a Coleman lantern and a flashlight. He told her he would stay out here and watch the house throughout the night. Before they went to bed, he went into their bedroom, and with help from his wife, pushed the king-sized bed as far away from the windows as they could. They agreed that his wife and kids would all sleep in that bed for the night, and he would keep watch around the house. She had grown up hunting and knew how to handle a gun just as good as him, so she insisted on keeping the shotgun in the room with them. He agreed, after making her promise to ask for a name before shooting anything. If it replied, John, please don't shoot it. There was a full moon that night, and John could see across the field and into the inky dark of the woods. The night air was filled with the sound of thousands of crickets, and the pond behind the house was full of croaking frogs. As the moon rose higher, clumps of weeds in the field began casting sinister shadows, and before long, John was seeing big hairy creatures sneaking up on him in each of them. He stood up and lit a cigarette, trying to shake the fear and concentrate on the task at hand. As he smoked, he wandered to the end of the porch and stood looking at the darkened barn. Something was different, but he couldn't quite place it. The front of the barn, facing the house, was open, and the moonlight was hitting it from the side, casting the interior in deep shadows. He stood watching the black openings as he finished his smoke, thinking about the missing pigs. He then realized what was wrong. All the crickets and frogs had gone silent. It was as quiet as the inside of a mausoleum at night. He could hear the minute, shrill buzz of his own nervous system. As he turned to walk back to his chair, he thought he saw movement in the barn. He looked intently at the opening, and could make out nothing, then turned his head a bit, to the side, and saw what looked like two red eyes, hovering about eight feet off the ground. He couldn't see if he was looking straight at them, but when he averted his eyes a little, they became clearer. They were a deep, burning coal red, almost invisible in the dark. Every few seconds, they would disappear when the creature blinked. His heart began thudding in his chest, and he waited for it to leave the barn and approach the house. He slowly backed up to his chair, never looking away, and picked up his .30-06. six. He walked back to the end of the porch and watched and waited. He stood looking at the blinking red eyes for what seemed like hours, and then the eyes blinked out and never came back. He watched intently, but could see no movement. He thought for a moment then grabbed the flashlight and shined it at the barn. The flashlight was too small to penetrate the darkness of the barn from this distance. He had to get closer. He was none too keen about leaving the relative safety of the porch and confronting a glowing-eyed monster in his barn, but he was damned if he was going to live in fear of his own house. He left the porch and began slowly working his way toward the barn, 
taking his time, building his courage up. He got closer and could still see no movement. It had gone further into the dark. He got within twenty feet of the opening, and his flashlight would now penetrate the gloom of the barn. He moved the feeble beam of light over the contents of the barn. An old tractor, an old pickup, boxes and buckets. Too many places for something to hide, even something big. He cautiously walked closer, now shining the flashlight down the barrel of his rifle. He stopped at the entrance and shined the light all over, searching the corners and under vehicles. He finally stepped into the barn, every sense straining for a sound or movement. He walked around the pickup, tensing for a huge hairy arm to reach out and grab him at any second. He made his way clear to the rear of the barn, without seeing anything, and slowly turned to leave. He felt both relieved, not to have encountered it in the dark, and frightened, and somewhat confused about where it could have gone. As he was walking out, he glanced at the wide stairs leading up into the hayloft and froze. He knew with complete certainty that it had climbed those stairs and was waiting for him to walk out under the hayloft and jump down on him. He couldn't move. He was literally frozen in fear. He swore he could hear the floorboards softly creak above him as an enormous weight edged stealthily closer to the edge. He stood with his heart pounding in his ears, unable to move, unable to act. Suddenly there was a booming explosion of a shotgun from the house, followed by his wife screaming. His paralysis broke, and he bolted out of the barn toward the house, completely forgetting what may have been in the hayloft. As he ran toward the house, he heard an inhuman roar coming from the woods behind the house. It sounded pissed off and in pain. It screamed again, and he heard branches breaking as it plowed through the forest. Thankfully, away from the house. He got to the house and almost knocked down the front door in his hurry to get inside. He ran down the hall to their room and found his family huddled together on the bed, sobbing. One of the windows was blown out, and his wife was still pointing the shotgun at it. When he burst into the room, she swung the gun in his direction and screamed and he hit the floor. He waited for the blast, but it didn't happen. He slowly stood up, and she had put the gun down, and he went to the bed. He asked her what had happened, but she was too shook up to answer just yet. Tim was crying. Why did you shoot the cowman, Mommy? Why? John Jr. had his face buried against his shoulder. After they calmed down a bit, he told them to get up and follow him. He led them to the living room, then went out to the open front door and looked carefully around. He could see no sign of it. All was quiet again. He told them to come out and get in the car. They ran out in their pajamas, piled in the car, got in, and drove them to their brother's house in Elma. On the way there, they had calmed down enough to tell him what had happened. She said a couple hours after they went to bed, she finally dozed off. She was awakened by Tim talking to someone, and this bizarre clicking, chirping sound. Tim wasn't in bed. He was standing in front of one of the windows. The moonlight was shining through both windows, illuminating the room pretty well. But there was a large shadow, like a tree, obscuring the window in front of Tim. She knew there were no trees close enough to cast a shadow. She told him to get away from the window. Mommy, listen, the cowman can sound like a bird, Tim said, pointing excitedly at the dark figure in the window. Timmy, get away from the window, she said, trying to keep her voice quiet. Right after she spoke, the noises from outside changed. It went from a soft chirping to a strange gibbering, almost like human speech, with an occasional pig-like snort thrown in. At this time, little John woke up and said, What is that? rather loudly. This seemed to incite the creature, and it hit the side of the house with its fists, hard enough for the walls to tremble. At this, little John screamed, and Tim yelled, Quiet, you're going to scare him away. She yelled at Tim to get away from the window again, and reached up on the headboard and grabbed the shotgun. She got out of bed and started toward Tim. The creature leaned down and looked straight in the window at her. She screamed and raised the shotgun, afraid to shoot because her son was too close. She started toward to grab Tim, and there was an explosion of breaking glass. A gigantic hairy arm reached through the window toward her son. She screamed again and fired over Tim's head, blowing out the rest of the window and hitting the creature with buckshot. It jerked backwards out of the window and disappeared into the dark. A few seconds later, she heard it screaming in the woods. It was trying to get Tim. It was trying to grab my baby. She started crying again, 
and he comforted her as best he could while driving. They stayed the rest of that night, and the following night with her brother's family. He told his brother about it, but he could see he didn't really believe him. He agreed to ride back to John's house with him early Monday morning before work. They had left the front door open in their haste to leave, and he was afraid animals or vandals would have gotten to the house. When they arrived, the house looked like a tornado had gone through it. The couch was upside down. They had a large, heavy console TV, and it was apparently thrown across the room, laying in a spray of broken glass. The kitchen was trashed, the refrigerator knocked over and food everywhere. The doors to both of the boys' rooms were left closed, and the rooms were untouched, same as the bathroom. The master bedroom was torn apart. The pillows ripped up and feathers everywhere. The chest of drawers was knocked over, and a large mirror was smashed. John's brother looked around in awe and said, You'd better call the police. John looked at him and said, And tell them what? Bigfoot destroyed my house? They left and closed the front door this time and drove to my dad's mill in Aberdeen. John's brother waited in the car while John went in and told this to my dad. After he was done, my dad said, Well, Let's go have a look at it then. They drove back out to the house, and John showed my dad the damage. He pulled the clump of hair from the shirt pocket and let my dad look at it. As they were walking through the house surveying the damage, my dad pointed out cracks in the ceiling where it apparently had stood up and hit its head on the ceiling. John told my dad that they couldn't live there anymore. Even if the creature was gone, they would have always been afraid. Their homeowner insurance wouldn't cover the damage. The adjuster just claimed that John must have done it in a drunken rage. My dad helped them find a place in Aberdeen and gave him a loan for new furniture and stuff. The house was eventually fixed up and sold, and my dad never heard about another problem there again. A few observations about my story. My dad lost contact with, quote, John and his family in the mid-80s. They moved out of state, and my dad hasn't heard from them since. His brother died around the same time. Why didn't they call the cops? John had a lot of pride, as well as a lot of common sense. He knew he couldn't have logically explained what had happened to the authorities, and he didn't want the story to get out and have him branded as some kind of nutcase. I asked my dad if they saved the hair. He said John never mentioned it again, and my dad never asked about it again. I asked my dad if he saw the footprint and muddy fingerprints. He said he did. He said it looked like a giant barefoot man, had stepped very carefully in the center of the mud. He's not a tracker, but he said it was the clearest print of any kind he had ever seen. I asked my dad if the neighbors had heard any of this. He said if they did, none of them ever mentioned it. I also asked him if he thought it was possible that John had made this all up, that it was him that had trashed the house in a drunken rage and made up an elaborate cover story. My dad said John and his family were truly terrified of that place. They didn't even want to go back to get their clothes. If it was just an elaborate story, what did he stand to gain? To profit from a story in any way, you have to share it with people. My dad and the other folks mentioned in the story are the only ones who ever heard it, until now, of course. He also said that whatever trashed the house was no man. The TV had to weigh close to 200 pounds, and it was obviously thrown across the room with great force. He said that even after two days, there was still a wild animal smell in the house. I asked my dad if he thought there might have been two creatures involved, considering the incident in the barn. He said he asked John the same question, and John said that he thought there was only one, and that it lured him into the barn, then snuck out the side door to the house. The thing he thought he heard in the hayloft was either his imagination or something common like a raccoon. For whatever reason... This creature seemed focused on their four-year-old son. Their son was the only one who never showed any fear of it. He seemed to think of it as his friend, and although the sex of the animal was never determined, it was referred to as a male because of the predatory stalking-type behavior. That, and the conspicuous lack of breasts. Or perhaps it just was not as well endowed as the Patterson film subject. Anyhow, its behavior almost seems indicative of a mother that has lost her little Bigfoot and is looking for a replacement. I asked my dad if little Timmy was a particularly hairy child 
perhaps suffering from a rare condition that causes uncontrollable hair growth all over the body. He said, no, Timmy was a normal young little boy, with normal brown hair on his normal head. I didn't ask if Timmy regularly reeked of rotting garbage and wet dogs, because that didn't seem polite. He told me of other possible Bigfoot encounters that he and his crew had in the woods around Gray's Harbor. None of them are quite as titillating as the Cowman story, but interesting nonetheless. Perhaps I'll share them, if there is an interest in hearing them. So at the end of the day, I was left with no leads to follow, no new evidence of anything. But I did come away with a pretty damn good story. So that is S.D. Baker's Cowman Report. I don't know anything about this author, S.D. Baker. This narrative could be authentic, or it could be completely fiction. But if you accept that these animals exist, then stories like this have happened. There's a lot more to say about this narrative, but I'll leave it at this for now. Anyway, thanks an awful lot for listening, and happy Halloween.